Hey everyone, it's the Doom Dog. You know, I have covered a lot of genres on this channel. First person shooters, third person shooters, survival horror games, side scrolling action games, platformers, role playing games both Japanese and Western, and even racing games with our Drivecast series. We have definitely covered a lot of ground here. But there is one genre that I have never really touched on before. Real-time strategy. I am most definitely not an RTS aficionado, but it is a genre that I do enjoy. I played the shit out of the Warcraft trilogy as well as Starcraft. I beat Alien vs Predator Extinction and Brutal Legend. And I have dabbled in Command and & Conquer and Doom 2. Well, there's a first time for everything, right? Today, we will be taking a look at the only Xbox 360 era Halo game that we have not discussed yet. Today, we will be talking about Halo Wars. If you know the history of the Halo franchise, it is only fitting that Halo would wind up becoming an RTS at some point. It was like the series came full circle with this release. Halo was originally announced at Apple's Macworld 1999 event. It was an RTS developed exclusively for the Mac platform, and Bungie had experience creating RTS games as they had previously created the Myth series. Of course, Microsoft bought Bungie, and the rest is history. It would be another decade before the series would return to its RTS roots, and it would be Ensemble Studios developing it instead of Microsoft. Ensemble was known for the Age of Empires series, so it was in good hands. This game has the worst and most tragic development cycle of any game that I have covered on this channel so far, and how this game turned out is very much tied to its development cycle. Let's talk about it. In 2004, Ensemble decided that they wanted to do more than just RTS games. They wanted to make games in other genres. They started working on a fantasy action RPG similar to Diablo called Sorcerer. And they started working on an MMORPG project called Titan that would be set in the Halo universe. Beyond these two projects, they did start working on another RTS, but this one was special. Ensemble wanted to prove that the RTS genre could be done well on a console. This game was called Project Phoenix, and it was to be a sci-fi game with humanity fighting against a machine-like race of aliens with two playable factions that played out very differently from each other. With the ideas for the story set more or less in stone, they set about the real challenge in front of them, making controls work on a console. They also decided that Microsoft's upcoming console, the Xbox 360, would be their platform of choice as it offered significantly more power for their ideas than the current batch of consoles did. The team working on the game was rather small because most of the employees at Ensemble wanted to work on the non-RTS games, but they were a tight-knit group who worked hard at coming up with and hashing out ideas for what might work for a control scheme. They spent years tinkering with it and perfecting it to make sure it felt good to control with a controller, instead of a mouse and keyboard. And they eventually showed their work to Microsoft. Microsoft was rather impressed with the game, but they were worried about a game's potential sales with it being a new IP. They told the team to take it and turn it into a Halo game instead. This was a major blow to the team because they had to scrap all their work and rework all of it to fit within the Halo universe. It was almost like starting from scratch. To compound things further, Microsoft did not tell Bungie that they were having another studio work on their series. 
Bungie did not know about it until Ensemble showed up at their studio and told them that they were making the Halo RTS. Bungie was pissed about this. They were very unhappy that another company was working on their baby. They never approved of the project. They said it felt like whoring out the franchise. Everything Ensemble did had to be approved by Bungie. When you combine this with most of Ensemble not wanting to work on this game and Bungie refusing to work with Ensemble almost entirely, you get very slow progress on the game. Most of the employees at Ensemble were working on Sorcerer and Titan, leaving just a small team to work on Halo Wars. Halo Wars was unveiled to the world at E3 2006 with a cinematic trailer. The trailer itself is pretty good, but it was not that well received by fans. Many Halo fans felt that it was strange that their beloved FPS series would become an RTS. Many more felt that RTS on a console would never work. This did not help the group's morale. For E3 2007, project lead Graham Devine wanted to quell those concerns and fears. He pieced together a rather impressive demo of the game to show off exactly what they were working on and how it would all work. He even went as far as to voice the demo himself. It was an impressive showing for the game, and it went over pretty well with the Halo community. Caution among fans turned into optimism for this project. After the successful E3 showing, word came down from Microsoft that they were canceling both the fantasy RPG Sorcerer and the MMORPG set in the Halo universe, Titan. Ensemble never got the green light from Microsoft to make Titan, and Microsoft feared that it would cut out a lot of the player base since it was being developed as a PC-only game. The team's attempt to avoid being pigeonholed as an RTS-only developer ultimately failed. A lot of the team at Ensemble were disappointed by this, and they found themselves working on Halo Wars instead of the projects that they wanted to work on. People were disgruntled, and they were bringing new ideas to Halo Wars that clashed with the team that was already working on it. This caused a fair bit of infighting, and Graham stepped down as project lead to be replaced by Dan Pottinger, who made numerous changes to how Halo Wars played, such as adding a button to select all units, and making bases smaller and more interconnected. This resulted in a very different product from the one shown at E3. If things were not going poorly enough for the studio, Microsoft was not happy that Ensemble had not shipped a new game since Age of Empires 3 in 2005. In September of 2008, just months before the launch of the game, Microsoft decided that they were going to close the studio down upon completion of the game. It was a major hit to morale, but only three people left the studio after this announcement. The vast majority of the team stayed on to see it through to the end, and Halo Wars was finally released on February 26, 2009. It was met with decent critical praise, and it did accomplish its goal of proving that an RTS game could work well on a console. That is a rather brief version of the story of this game's development. There is a lot more to it. This is just a brief summary. If you want a lengthy, in-depth dive about its creation, the channel Around the Monitor did an excellent video on it. I will leave a link in the description below to that video if you want to take a look at it. For now, let's see how Ensemble's final game turned out. This is Halo Wars for the Xbox 360. Halo Wars is a prequel to the entire series. It takes place 20 years before the main games. The date is February 4th, 2531, and the game first introduces us to Cutter, the captain of the UNSC ship 
called the Spirit of Fire. This ship has been tasked with the defense of the planet of Harvest. The game does not mention this, but Harvest is a significant planet in the Halo universe because it was the first to get attacked and glassed by the Covenant. At the start of the game, Cutter has just won the planet back after five long years of fighting. This ship has an AI named Serena that looks a lot like Cortana. Her existence in this game makes me wonder what makes Cortana so special. Functionally, she seems to be just as capable as Cortana is. The two are very similar in purpose and ability. What exactly is it about Cortana that makes her more important than this? AI or any other one. She seems no more and no less advanced than Cortana was. Anyway, Cutter gets a transmission from his sergeant down on the planet, a man named Forge. Forge says that the Covenant have found something in the ice. And you should probably investigate it. Cutter says that this complicates the mission, but he does not explain how. In what way does this complicate the mission? The mission is to deal with the Covenant down on the planet. Wouldn't investigating this fall under that umbrella? Anyway, we are introduced to a fourth and final main character here. She is the ship's science officer and her name is Anders. She is monitoring Covenant activity on the surface below. They seem to have uncovered some sort of structure down there. You need to find out what it is, but first you need to get your base back up and running again. Unfortunately, it is currently in the hands of the Covenant. Find surviving soldiers and regroup to make your way back to the base location and take it back. Clear it out of enemies and Cutter orders Forge to scout the area. While scouting, Forge sees an arbiter outside of a massive door. I have to wonder if Forge can hear the conversation. The player is let in for the sake of the story, but what about Forge? It's also worth noting that this is not the Arbiter we grew to know and love over the course of Halo 2. This was long before his rise to prominence in the Covenant. Keep that in mind any time I refer to the Arbiter. Remember that this was a title of a holy warrior for the Covenant. Anyway, the Arbiter demands that the door be opened. Another elite wonders about the infection defiling the relic. The infection? He better not be talking about what I think he's talking about because that would not make any sense at all. The Arbiter instructs him to open the door anyway and they do it, so... The Arbiter looks back over his shoulder like he knows he is being watched, but he does not see anyone. Anders has set up her lab on the observation deck what of the Spirit of Fire. Forge does not want her to like come you. down to the planet, and she disagrees, <laughs> insisting that she needs to. Cutter Forge approves of her going down there, but he wants her to come back up to the ship at the first sign of trouble. The Arbiter meets with the Prophet of Regret, and Robin Atkins Downs reprises his role as Regret in this one. This was a nice surprise because we have not seen this character since Halo 2. The Prophet wants the relic to be destroyed when the Arbiter is done. The Arbiter questions why, and he says that the Great Journey demands sacrifice. I guess you aren't supposed to ask questions of the Hierarchs? Back down on the planet's surface at the base, you just took back. The power is currently down, and you are sealed inside behind electronic doors leading outside. You need to get the base back up and running again in order to end the lockdown and escape from the base. After that, you need to reach the relic and stop the Covenant from blowing it up. After amassing an army, destroy the detonator to secure the relic. Now you can explore it and find out what the Covenant are up to. Anders comes down to the planet to join you. 
Anders and Forge enter the ancient Forerunner Relic. Forge urges caution. Anders activates the console inside and brings up a map of the stars that points to another location in the galaxy. A star map? Like Knights of the Old Republic? Anders does not get to examine it long before the group is ambushed by a group of elites. Forge calls for backup, but the base is too far away. The Spirit of Fire drops off a couple of grizzly tanks, take them into the relic and rescue Anders and Forge. When you reach the group, you take control of the two as well as the soldiers with them. You have to fight your way back out of the relic. As you approach the light bridge, a group of Covenant blow up the controls, causing it to deactivate. You need to head to the other side to get that one working. Defend Anders as she does that. Make your way across the bridge and escape from the relic. Call for an extraction and drop ships will pick you up and take you back to the Spirit of Fire. Anders tells Cutter that the star map pointed to another system, and Serena says that it is called Arcadia. It has three million residents, and the Covenant are headed right to it. Anders wants to go, which means abandoning Harvest. Cutter says that he will clear it with the higher-ups and then go after them. I guess they gave him the okay on this? It seems a little odd that they would be okay with him just abandoning his mission on Harvest. When you arrive at Arcadia, there are two Covenant ships that have already arrived. The UNSC ships have engaged them. One of them is the Pillar of Autumn. Was there any need for this one to be that specific ship? You never even see it in this game. It is only mentioned. One of the Covenant cruisers was taken out, and two of the UNSC ships were as well. The other two were badly damaged, and the Covenant are attacking the colony on the surface. You need to help evacuate the citizens. One of the evac ships gets impatient with your rescue efforts and tries to take off early. It gets shot down out of the sky, and the Spartans local to Arcadia suggests you set up a base, which you absolutely should do so you can build more forces to defend the evac ships. After surviving a seemingly endless onslaught of enemies, the evac ships will take off and Cutter orders you to pull back and regroup. As you are running away to regroup, the Covenant are chasing after you. Fall back to a defendable position and strengthen your forces for a Covenant counterattack. Serena lets you know about an impact creator that will be perfect for this. So head there and start building up a new base. You are given a team of Spartans called Omega as backup. When you have gathered a large enough force, carry out a counterattack and take out the nearby Covenant base. Cutter calls Forge back up to the bridge. The Covenant is inspecting another Forerunner site, and they have set up a massive energy shield to protect it. You cannot see what they are doing. Plasma can punch a hole through it though, so you can have some Plasma Rhino tanks get through the shield and discover what they are up to. When you attempt this with one take, it is not enough and Banshees fly out of the shield and destroy your tank. You are going to need multiple Rhinos. After getting all the tanks in place, fire on the dome and successfully punch a coal in the energy shield. This allows you to use Mac Blast to destroy the Covenant base inside. After doing so, you are free to fly into the dome and set up your own base in the area. The Arbiter is concerned that he is wasting time searching through empty ruins. He has been tasked with leading the campaign against the humans and he feels that his services could be put to better use elsewhere. He suggests that he takes the forces the Covenant do have an attack, but Regret rejects this idea, saying that that would leave them defenseless. 
he seems certain that this world will lead them to a massive fleet. He orders the Arbiter to kidnap Anders and bring her to him. You are inside the dome setting up a new base, and the Covenant have partially constructed a massive scarab on the entrance to another Forerunner structure. There is a wall separating you from it hiding your base. You need to destroy it before it can tear apart the wall and destroy your base. Build up your army and destroy the scarab so that you can access the ruins. Anders and Forge are investigating the runes when the Arbiter pops up and grabs her. Forge challenges him to a fight, and the two of them square off. Anders gets in between them and breaks it up. The Arbiter grabs Anders, and he beams the two of them up to the ship. Forge contacts the Spirit of Fire, and Serena tracks her transponder. They chase after the Covenant and leads them to yet another unknown planet. And the Flood are here. Why? Why are the Flood in this game? This makes no fucking sense. The Covenant and humanity are not supposed to run into the Flood at all until 20 years after this game takes place. So how the hell could they have run into them over the course of this game? This fucks up the Halo timeline. And it makes no sense when both sides of the war are so shocked with the sudden appearance of the Parasite in Halo 1 and 2. There is absolutely no need to include the Flood in this game at all. Fuck, this is stupid. Anyway, Serena tracks Anders down to the surface and Cutter sends Forge down there to track her down. You are given a mobile base called an elephant, and you can train soldiers out of it. Build up an army quick and attack the enemy position. A group of Spartans called Echo Team gets attacked, and you lose contact with them. Take a team to help them out. You lose contact with another group called India as well. You need to rescue them too. Rescue the first team and bring their elephant back to safety. Cutter approves setting up a base, so build one up, train up an army, and set out to attack the Flood with more powerful units than what the elephant has to offer. Free the last elephant and bring it back to your base. Forge asks Serena about the transponder, and she says she is still trying to confirm Anders' coordinates. The team of Spartans known as Red Team is trying to breach Anders. Wait? Red Team? Glory, glory to the Red Team! Glory, glory to the Red Team! Glory, glory to the Red Team, the Red Team marches on. They are fighting off the Flood, and you need to provide them with reinforcements. When you take out one of the nearby Flood colonies, they note that it seems to hurt the large Flood form nearby. Serena says that killing the smaller colonies weakens the larger one. Red Team sends you coordinates for other colonies that they encounter. Take them out too. You do need to be quick about this as the colonies will eventually begin to regenerate. Take them all out and then kill the big flood form. Serena loses track of Anders and she suggests the signal is being blocked by the large flood form. As soon as the creature dies, she picks up a new signal. Anders is being held captive by the Covenant and the Arbiter introduces her to Regret. An Elite informs the Arbiter that a human ship is nearby. He orders it to be destroyed. The new signal has led you to a giant ocean. A massive door opens up and Sentinels fly out of it. You still have troops on the surface below and you need to gather them and return them to the ship. You have a limited time to do this, but Serena will try to find a way to buy you more time. There are multiple pylons spread out around the local area that are generating the tractor beam that the Spirit of Fire is caught up in. If you shut them down, 
you can buy more time. Serena sends you a gremlin that fires an EMP that shuts down the beings. Send them to the various locations on the map to give yourself more time to gather your troops. When you find the third and final batch of troops, the evac ship gets shot down by the flood. You have to bring them back to your base on foot. After gathering them all back at your base, Cutter has Serena send down an evac ship to bring you back up to the Spirit of Fire. After retrieving everyone from the surface, the ship enters the planet and the giant doorway closes behind you. The planet is hollow. The Flood are attaching themselves to the hull of ship and you need to find a way to get them off of it. They are dropping pods onto the hull and adding to their numbers. The ship's decontamination sequence damages and potentially kills any Flood form that you have already done damage to. But it can hurt you as well. You need to fend off and injure the Flood forms to make them go dormant so that the decontamination sequence can clean them off once and for all and then pull your troops back into the bunker so that it can sweep across the ship without damaging your soldiers. Sentinels will attack both your soldiers and the flood forms. I understand why they are attacking the flood, but why do they attack you? Do they not recognize humanity as reclaimers like 343 Guilty Spark did? His sentinels did not attack you until you went against his wishes, and he recognized you as a threat. We have not run across any monitor for this installation. Without one, do they just attack any life form on sight? Anyway, Clear the flood off the hole and Forge informs Cutter that it is clear. Cutter tells Serena to put maximum power to the engines and get you out of the center of the planet. The Spirit of Fire shoots out of the side of the planet. There is a Covenant cruiser directly in your path. Cutter swerves the ship to the side, but the two of them do scrape each other. They prepare to attack each other. Everyone gets to their battle stations and the ship needs repairs. Cutter has forged fend off Covenant forces while repairing the hull. Your goal is to repair the power core and fend off Covenant forces. They will attack in waves and you can requisition troops to fend them off while you have a new unit repair the ship. This is the only level in the game where you get these units to repair anything. Why is this the only level where you can repair anything? This would be extremely useful far earlier in the game than this. Anyway, repair the core and Cutter has Serena fly the ship away to safety. Anders is being held prisoner and Arbiter approaches her and grabs her. He uses her hand to activate the massive fleet so a map of the stars sent us hopping from one planet to another and ultimately leads us to a massive fleet of ships? This really is Knights of the Old Republic. This is some Starforge shit. Arbiter gives a speech about how the Covenant is going to use the fleet to wipe out humanity. While he is distracted, Anders uses their unguarded teleporter to teleport herself down to the surface. Did I miss something? When did the Covenant become this fucking stupid? When Anders lands on the planet, she draws the attention of the Flood. They approach her, and she backs away when gunshots ring out and kill them. It turns out to be Forge. Forge and Anders back off and fend off the Flood. They call down some ODSTs to help them out. After dealing with the Flood, you need to find a spot for transport. Hold out until said transport arrives and picks up Anders. It takes her up to the Spirit of Fire. She believes she knows how to stop the Covenant. But she needs to get back to her lab. Forge 
needs to stay on the surface to secure this area. Fight off the Covenant forces and destroy a small base near you. Start building a base and build up your forces. The Covenant left a scare behind, and you can take control of that. After destroying all four Covenant bases, Forge radios Cutter and asks if Anders is ready. She is, and Cutter has you stand by for a mission briefing. Anders' plan is to overload the FDL reactor to cause the sun to go supernova. This will destroy the Covenant's entire fleet. Serena says that she is not sure how they will escape. Cutter says that they should tackle one problem at a time because these ships could mean the end of the war. While carrying the reactor down to the surface, one of the Pelicans crashes and Cutter changes it to ground operation. You need to drive the reactor up to where it needs to be. And Cutter sends down engineers to rig the core. Forge and the team are activating the reactor when they get ambushed by the Arbiter and a bunch of elites. A group of Spartans take on the Elites while Forge goes after the Arbiter. Wouldn't the Spartans be a better match for the Elites than Forge is? Whatever. After some struggle, Forge kills him by stabbing him in the neck with a knife and running him through with his own energy sword. The reactor is already overheating. This means that someone will have to blow the core manually. This will kill whoever does it. Forge volunteers to sacrifice himself to finish the mission. Rest in peace, Forge. We hardly knew ye. Literally, we know next to nothing about him. The exit passage that he needs to take the core through has been sealed off, and you need to open it to let him through. There are six doors with three matching pairs, and you need to activate the matching pairs to open them all. If there are any non-human life near the controls for the doors, they will not open. Forge is on his way, and you have a limited time to do this. You need to be quick. After activating all six doors, the portal opens. All forces evacuate to the Spirit of Fire. And Forge gives a little bit of time and blows the core. The sun goes supernova and the gravity field for it starts expanding as a result. This makes escape even more difficult, but Cutter decides that she will slingshot around the sun and catapult herself away from it. How does getting this close to the sun not cook everyone inside the ship or destroy it? Do you know how hot the fucking sun is? How in the world could you resist heat like that? Whatever, it works, and the Spirit of Fire escapes. Two weeks later, there have been no sign of the Covenant, and the crew are entering stasis pods. Does this mean that they're just floating around aimlessly in space now? Is there some sort of autopilot? Is Serena in charge? What will happen if her rampancy sets in while everyone is still in stasis? Why don't they have new orders from the higher-ups? None of this is explained and the story ends here. That's it. That's the full story of Halo Wars. That is the big prequel to the entire franchise. Obviously it has one massive glaring flaw and that is the inclusion of the Flood. That fucks up the entire timeline of Halo because humanity and the Covenant are not supposed to encounter the Flood at all until the original game in the series. It takes place 20 years after this. If humanity and the Covenant run into the Flood well before that game took place, why was it such a surprise in Halo 1? Why didn't Cortana go, oh, yeah, these guys. A ship called the Spirit of Fire ran into them once 20 years ago. Furthermore, why are they on this random planet? One of the points of the rings is to contain the Flood, but you do not run into any rings in this game. Why then are they here? How did they never spread to any other planet? 
if they are contained in more Forerunner structures than just the rings, why are they not contained in this game? Do you see how the Flood being in this game royally fucks up the timeline? The sad thing is that the Flood really do not add anything significant to this story. You could remove them from the game entirely with only minimal rewrites. It might result in a shorter campaign, but that seems like a worthwhile sacrifice. If you wind up with a more consistent story and lore overall, maybe there is some explanation in a novel or something that makes this make sense, but I certainly cannot wrap my head around the Flood being in this game making sense at all. And I cannot write this game off as a non-canon entry into the series either. That would solve the problem here, but no. This game is canon because it has a sequel. Halo Wars 2 stars the Spirit of Fire and her crew yet again. It takes place after the main trilogy and it features a new force called the Banished, which is a new form of the Covenant, essentially, that is led by the Brutes. And we know that one is canon as well because the Banished are also going to be the main bad guys in the upcoming game Halo Infinite. Nope. This game is canon, and it just baffles me. You might be asking yourself where the rest of the story is. If you are familiar with the RTS genre, then you know that both sides of the conflict are typically get campaigns with their own story. I know the Covenant are the main bad guys of the series, but that's not stopped RTS devs before. The Orcs were the bad guys in Warcraft 1 and 2, for example, and they still had their own campaigns. Well, to answer your question, there is no Covenant campaign. I really wish there was. It would be such a good opportunity to either see the other side of the story or to continue the story with the Covenant. It would give us a good in-depth look at the Covenant and how they work. It could very well give us an even more deep dive into them than we got in Halo 2. And that would have been awesome. But sadly, there is no Covenant campaign. They are playable in multiplayer, but this just feels like a wasted opportunity. Beyond that, this has other problems. Without the Flood, this would be an inconsequential and forgettable story in the series. And that all boils down to the writing. The characters of this game are not memorable in the slightest. Cutter is basically a stand-in for Lord Hood. Serena is a stand-in for Cortana, and Forge is a stand-in for Sergeant Johnson. The problem is that none of them are as memorable as the original characters. I know I've said in the past that those characters are not the most in-depth characters in the world, and they weren't. They were static characters, but they had quotable lines and memorable moments that made them stand out and be likable. You do not get anything like that here. Go on. Quote Cutter or Forge from this game. Most people won't be able to do that because the dialogue is stock with little to no flavor or room for personality. From a story standpoint, it's immensely forgettable. It's a shame too. Blur Studios, who did the excellent CG animated cutscenes in the Anniversary Edition of Halo 2, first sank their teeth into Halo with this game. The CG in this game is fan-fucking-tastic. It really stands out as visually stunning storytelling with some decent fight choreography. It's just used to tell a story that you will probably forget five minutes after you turn off the console and move on to other games. This feels like the result of Bungie wanting nothing to do with this game and Ensemble feeling stuck and unable to make anything of major significance to the series as a result. The story is nothing to write home about and the inclusion of the Flood was a big mistake. How does it look then? First things first, Ensemble absolutely nailed the Halo art style. Remember that they were getting little to no help from Bungie when they were making this game, so they basically had to study the Halo art design in very close detail to make sure they got everything right. 
You can tell that they did their homework on this one because this looks spot on with everything that Bungie had done up to this point. What's more impressive is that Ensemble introduced a number of new units for both sides of the conflict for this game, and they had to design them to look like they belong in the Halo universe without any external help. Once again, they knocked it out of the park. It would have been easy to accidentally create something that looks out of place, but they didn't. You can see how much the art team cared about getting everything right. When designing an RTS, you need to have a lot of moving pieces on screen at any given time. You need far more than any other type of game because you are building armies and engaging in battles against the enemy. In order to do this, you typically need to be more lax on the graphical detail of each unit. Sacrifices had to be made to make it work at all, and this is especially true of a console RTS. A good gaming PC is and has always been better for this than its console counterpart. Halo Wars was designed around being played on a console, and it definitely means sacrificing some graphical detail to make it all work. This is the case here. If you zoom in, you will notice each individual unit has less detail than its counterpoint in Halo 3 and Halo Reach. It's noticeable for sure there is less detail to everything on screen than there was in the 360 FPS games. Having said that, it does not matter that much because you will spend the vast majority of your time in a more zoomed out view of the world. Looking at it all from further away goes a long way to hiding the lower level of detail. The more simple art style of the Halo series and the sheer number of units on screen at any given time also helps hide this. Overall, this is a rather impressive technical achievement for a console RTS. It really looks good. Having said that, it is most definitely not perfect. This game has slowed down and it is definitely noticeable. When you get into heavy battles, you can see the frame rate start to chug. You can tell that getting this many units onto the screen at any given time really pushes the Xbox 360 hardware to its limits. This does not ruin the game by any means. It's definitely something that you will take note of as you play through the game, though. The in-engine cutscenes also look a little rough. I swear they look like they were recorded at a lower resolution than the main game and upscaled or something. I am not sure what is going on here, but they look pixelated at times with visible artifacts on screen. They get the job done as far as telling the story goes, but they definitely look a little rough around the edges. I have already touched on this, but the game does have CG cutscenes throughout that were made by Blur Studios, who did the gorgeous cutscenes in Halo 2 Anniversary. As you would expect, Blur did excellent work here. These cutscenes are simply stunning to look at to this very day. They have held up very well in the decade plus since this game's release. Luckily, most of the game's narrative is told in these instead of in-game cutscenes. What about the audio then? Well, this game certainly sounds like a Halo game. I do not know if Bungie gave them audio files to use or if they had to recreate everything from scratch. If it is the latter, they did a truly impressive job at it. Everything sounds exactly like it should. Plasma shots sound right, rifle shots sound correct, the Warthog sounds accurate, so on and so forth. When I say accurate, I mean accurate to how Halo 1, 2, and 3 sound. It does not have the better and more bassy gun audio of Halo Reach and 4. That is probably a good thing, though. Imagine 40 or so of Halo 4's weapons coming through your speakers at any given time. That sounds like it would be absolute hell on your speakers. It makes sense too because this game was in development throughout ODST's development and part of Reach's. I do not mind the weapon audio in this one though. 
I know I have been hard on the audio design of the previous games for having weak sounding weapons. But that was from the first person perspective when I had direct control over those weapons. In a game like this, I don't. I'm far away directing the battle. That comes with a whole different set of expectations on how weapons should and will sound. In this instance, accuracy is more important than sounding powerful. In that regard, Ensemble Studios nailed it. The environmental audio is good, but what about the voice acting? Well, Forge is played by Nolan North, and Nolan North always turns in a great performance in everything he is in. This game is no exception to that. Forge may not have much personality to go off of, but he is well acted at least. More than anyone, I would say that he is the most standout performance. That's taking nothing away from the other actors. Nolan North is just a great actor. Personally, I cannot help but think of Nathan Drake when I hear his voice. This will definitely not be a problem for everyone that plays this game, but I played so much Uncharted that I instantly associate his voice with that character in specific. Maybe you have not played Uncharted, or that is not who you instantly go back to when you hear his voice, but this is how it was for me. It was a little distracting, he still turned in a good performance. As previously mentioned, this game does bring back the Prophet of Regret, who was featured heavily in Halo 2. Ensemble Studios managed to bring back Robert Atkins Downs to reprise his role for the character in this game, and I am more than happy to hear it. It is nice to hear him back in this role again, though the story does not do that much with his character. It was a welcome surprise. Aside from Nolan North, who has made quite a name for himself as a video game actor, this does not use big name actors for its various characters. Greg Berger turns in a good performance as Captain Cutter. Courtney Taylor has a nice performance as Serena, the ship's AI. She played Jack in Mass Effect and was excellent in that. I would argue that she was better there than here. Dave Sobolov turns in a very angry performance as the Arbiter. He plays a very different Arbiter than the one that we have in Halo 2 and 3. This one is much more headstrong and short-tempered. As usual, the voice work in this game is good across the board. That is typical for this series. No one turns in a bad performance. There aren't any lines or line reads that stand out as particularly bad. The problem with this game is not the voice actors or their performances. It's the material that they were given. The dialogue is not memorable. You can take the best actors in the world and have them act out these lines, and you would still not get anything that really sticks out. It would still be instantly forgettable the moment you turned off the console and walked away. Halo Wars marked the first time that the Halo franchise was handed to another company. And that means the music is not done by Marty O'Donnell and Michael Salvatore. Those are some massive shoes to fill in and quite a legacy to live up to. Attempting to do so fell onto the hands of Ensemble Studios composer Stephen Rippey. He was known specifically for the Age of Empires and Age of Mythology series before he tackled this project. I have not played either of those two series, so Halo Wars was really my introduction to his work. Halo 4 had a good soundtrack, but it was very jarring when moving from the previous games to it because it was so drastically different than anything that came before it. But that really is not the case here. This feels like Steven decided to go the route with trying to fit in with what fans had come to expect of this series, instead of doing his own thing. This is not necessarily a bad route to go, but it is naturally going to draw comparisons to the soundtracks that came before it. When you are working on a franchise like this, you really need to bring your A-game. This game sets off a very good first impression. As you boot it up, you get to the title screen and you get this soft piano intro that carries with it a lot of weight and emotion. 
it builds up gradually and leads into another rendition of the Halo theme. This opening piece is excellent and it is fitting of a rather tragic war game, which Halo tries to be. After that, though, none of the tracks are as good as that opening one. They're not bad at all. They serve their purpose well enough to give a nice atmosphere to the individual levels and the gameplay. In typical Halo style, they have an effective mix of electric guitar and more symphonic stuff. But you can tell that this is not a Marty and Michael soundtrack. These are not tracks that will get stuck in your head long after you turn the power off. Much like the story itself, a lot of the music is fairly forgettable. I do quite like the tunes that play during the credits, though. It's sad, too, because you can spend upwards of an hour on some of these levels, building bases and fighting enemies. That's a long time to spend training troops and upgrading all of your men as you listen to the background music. It would be nice to have something memorable, such as StarCraft's various themes, or the killer MIDI music from Doom 2. We don't get that here, though. We get serviceable, but not memorable. I do not want to call the music bad because it's not, but this is the weakest Halo soundtrack that we have covered so far. As a complete package, the audio is pretty good overall. None of the elements are particularly bad, and there definitely are some things that stand out about it. Nolan North gives a good performance, Robin Atkins Downs is always fun as regret. The audio balancing is good so you never have problems making out what each individual sound is and the dialogue is never drowned out by things like gunfire. And the audio for the units, the weapons, and the environments all sound exactly like they should. With a forgettable story, underdeveloped characters, and mostly forgettable soundtrack, it all comes down to the gameplay to raise things up. Great gameplay can lift up a game that is mediocre in other areas. So, how does Halo Wars play? Surprisingly enough, it actually plays pretty well. It is far better than you would expect when you hear the phrase console-exclusive RTS. That is for certain. As previously mentioned, when Ensemble started this project, the goal was to prove that an RTS game could work on a console. This presented a massive hurdle. Ever since quite literally day one of this genre with the release of Doom 2 on DOS PCs back in 1992, this has been the most PC focused of any major genre. It has always required precise clicks for unit selection and keyboard shortcuts to maximize your effectiveness in leading your armies into battle. The thumbstick is great for a lot of things, but it will never be as precise as a mouse. And the lack of a keyboard has always meant that RTS games are almost unaccessible to consoles. There have been attempts before this, but very few of them have been so much as decent, let alone great. With the release of this game, Ensemble accomplished their goal. They proved that an RTS could work well on a console. How did they accomplish this? Well, mostly by simplifying the gameplay, to be honest. They made a number of smart changes to the gameplay that results in a simplified but engaging RTS. They also greatly reduced the size of the armies that you can build. I'm sure that this was partially done to simplify the gameplay to make it work on a console and partially to make it easier on the Xbox 360 hardware. What have they done then? Well, you really only have one resource to manage in this game, and that is money. Where most RTS games have more than one resource, this game only makes you worry about money. There is no limit to the supply, of how much money you can earn, either. As long as you set up your supply pads, you will keep earning cash. You do not have to worry about your units being killed while bringing money back to the base, either. As long as the supply pad stands, you will keep earning cash. 
Beyond that, you have various tech levels that you can achieve based on how many nuclear reactors you have. You will never need more than three to fully upgrade everything and build every unit that the game has to offer. Resource management really is that simple. And you can upgrade your nuclear reactor to provide two tech levels. That means that you can build two reactors to have access to every unit and any upgrade. Supply pads can also be upgraded to provide you with more money. And the speed at which you build is only limited by how quickly you can gather money. The more supply pads you have, the faster you can gather money. The faster you can gather money, the more and more powerful units that you can build and the faster you can build them. It's not as simple as building a ton of supply pads though because base building has also been simplified. These bases are all interconnected so you only have a set number of slots on each base where you can build structures. You can put two supply pads, one nuclear reactor, and one of each other kind of building on a fully upgraded base. If you want to build other buildings you will need to either build a new base or destroy one of your structures and build a new one in its place. Building a new base seems like the easier option, but there are only a select few spots on the map where you can build bases. Unlike something like StarCraft and Warcraft where you can place a new base anywhere where there is enough flat ground in enough space, there are only specific pre-chosen places where you can build a new base to build a new reactor and new supply pads to gather money faster. If you do not currently have a new place to build, you will have to live with the specific slots that you have. It makes you stop and think about the balance of how quickly you want to gather resources and what kind of units you want to build and how quickly you want to build them. Just like every typical RTS, you have multiple unit types that you can build. You have a couple of soldier types with the infantry and the hellbringers, who are flamethrowers. There are also a number of ground vehicles that you can use as well as the Warthog and the Scorpion tank. You get some air combat vehicles as well, such as the Hornet, which we saw in Halo 3, and the Vulture. There are a lot of Unix for you to experiment with in each of the levels. Play around with them and find out what works best for you. There are specific levels with special units as well. Mission 5, Dome of Light, gives you Plasma Rhino tanks which you can use to punch a hole in the Covenant's dome. In Mission 12 Repairs, you get the Cyclops, which is a human unit in a suit that they use to repair things. This is the only level in the game where you can repair your structures, and that annoys me a little bit. The Cyclops is a unit that would come in extremely handy in pretty much any other level in the game as well as they could repair your structures after your base has been attacked. The game also does a decent job of giving you mission variety. Like any good more modern real-time strategy game, this game does not have you building bases and attacking the enemy in every level. It certainly does have its share of those types of typical RTS levels as they are the basis for the entire genre, but it mixes it up pretty well. The first mission of the game has you taking back the base, for example. You don't actually have to build a base and an army until the second mission. Outside of that, there are missions like 11 and 12 where you train troops but do not build a base at all as you are on the outer hull of the Spirit of Fire defending it from enemies. The third mission of the game sees you take a couple of tanks to mount a rescue operation. And there are timed missions where you have to fight your way through hordes of enemies to rescue a group to protect civilians as they are trying to escape the Covenant as well. 
Halo Wars does well to make sure that the campaign does not get boring and repetitive by giving you excellent mission variety. It's not all good though, because the difficulty curve of this game is all over the fucking place. The first three missions are not all that difficult and are very manageable. Then you get to mission four, where you need to help the Arcadia colony evac while the Covenant are attacking. The game suddenly gets extremely hard. Even on the standard difficulty, this makes for a severe difficulty spike, and you are likely to not beat it on your first try. On the highest difficulty setting, you pretty much have to be perfect or you will never beat it. Then it goes right back to manageable for the fifth mission. It might be forgivable if this was the only level to have such a massive difficulty spike, but it's not. Mission 7, Scarab, and Mission 10, Shield World, also have spikes in difficulty compared to the levels that come before and after them. It creates a rather uneven difficulty curve throughout the entire game. The final mission of the game is the level that took me the most attempts to beat, but that's a little more forgivable since it is the last mission and it is supposed to be the hardest. Still, it would be better if this game had a more gradual curve of increasing difficulty instead of sudden spikes. All of that is fine and dandy, but how does it control? Well, your cursor is constantly on the center of the screen and you move it with the left stick. You hit the A button to select a unit or structure Double click on the unit to select all the other units currently on screen of that type. The right bumper selects all units on screen. The left button selects all units, including those currently not on screen. This makes unit selection easy to do, though selecting specific groups for tasks like you would on PC is a lot more difficult. Moving all your units is easy. You move the cursor to where you want them to go and hit the X button. The unit will receive the order and move there. Attacking works exactly the same way. When you have your unit selected, hit the X button over whatever you want your characters to attack and they will march into range of that enemy and start attacking it. The camera is designated to the right stick. You can twirl it around to get a better look at whatever you are trying to do, and you can move the camera up and down by pushing the stick forward or pulling it back. This allows you to get a closer look at the battlefield to select specific units easier when they are all massed together. There are a lot of units with special attacks as well. For example, infantry units will toss grenades at the enemy or, when upgraded, fire rockets at the enemy. Warthogs will try to ram and run over the enemy. These are also carried out with a simple press of a button. Select the unit or units that you want to carry out the special attack and move the cursor over the thing that you want to attack and hit the white button. It's really that simple. Base building is also simple. It is done through a radial menu. Select the slot where you want to build a structure and it brings up a radial menu. Use the thumbstick to select the structure that you want to build and hit the A button. Upgrading structures and units and building new units works exactly the same way. Simply select the upgrade that you want or the unit that you want to train and hit the A button. All in all, it's fairly simple and easy to use. You will get the hang of it quickly and be building bases and upgrading your units and training soldiers in no time. It is an easy to grasp system, but it is effective. It works well. Ensemble Studio set out to prove that RTS games could work on consoles, and they achieved that through smart design, simplification, and streamlining the genre. It plays well, and it will offer you hours of fun strategy gameplay. It's good enough to hold the player's attention from beginning to end. All in all, this is one of the best RTS games ever to come to a console. I know what you're thinking. That is not particularly high praise, and you are more or less right about that. 
before this game, good RTS games on consoles were few and far between. It was mostly inferior ports of PC games like StarCraft on the Nintendo 64 and Dune 2 on the Genesis and WarCraft 2 on the PlayStation 1. Having said that, Halo Wars does stand out. It achieved something that many thought was impossible by making this style of game work well on a console. The only console RTS that I have played that is better than this one is Brutal Legend. If you are a console gamer, this is about as good as RTS games get. It is impressive in that sense, but PC gamers may not be that impressed with it. Simplifying it does mean that it is something of a beginner's RTS game. It's not the most in-depth or complex, and army sizes are pretty limited by the hardware. Blizzard was making better RTS games back in 1998. Such is the nature of the genre. What is extremely good on consoles is only decent on PC. What about replay value then? Well, Halo Wars has a fair bit of it. It has multiplayer, but I have never played it. I cannot tell you exactly how good that is. I have enjoyed many online RTS games in the past, though. Beyond that, there are reasons to revisit the campaign. Halo Wars does have skulls to collect, Finding all of them presents its own challenge, and they affect how the game plays. There are black boxes in each of the levels that gives you more information about the Halo timeline as well. There are multiple difficulties to try, though the difficulty spikes might make these infuriating. I enjoyed it enough to beat it multiple times, at least. All in all, Halo Wars is a remarkable RTS game as a console exclusive. If you play only on console, this is about as good as the genre gets, and I would definitely recommend picking it up and playing through it. If you play on PC, however, you have probably played a better real-time strategy game than this before. It will be a decent RTS game for you guys, and nothing more. If you like the Halo universe, you should still give it a playthrough. It will offer up enough fun to warrant at least one playthrough. Every previous Halo game that I have reviewed has multiple ways to play it, and Halo Wars is no different. You have been looking at the Xbox 360 version recorded off of an Xbox 360 this entire time, but the game was made backwards compatible for the Xbox One. This version does not have enhanced Xbox One X support, but it does look smoother and it runs with a better frame rate. It does not seem to dip when the action gets heavy like it does on the Xbox 360. It runs well here. There is a remaster of this game as well, though the upgrades are somewhat minimal. This also does not have Xbox One X enhanced support, but it does run at a higher native resolution and it shoots for 60 FPS. I do not know how often it hits that target, but it definitely feels better to play than the Xbox 360 original ever did. It does receive something of a visual upgrade with a smoother and cleaner look to it all, but this is not a fair bit sharper like the Master Chief Collection. Still, I am glad that Ensemble Studios' final game lives on for a new generation of people to experience. With the release of the Definitive Edition came the PC version. It allows you to go above 1080p resolution of the console version, and it has better looking visuals. It can run at higher frame rates as well. This is the best looking version of the game, but I have to be honest, moving Halo Wars over to PC removes what makes it special. It goes from being one of the best of its kind to... Why don't I just play StarCraft 2 instead? There are a lot of better options for RTS games on PC, but there really aren't on consoles. If you want the best looking version of this game with the highest frame rate, this is it. But why would I want to play this on PC when I could play a better and more advanced RTS? I think the console version of Definitive Edition is the best version as a result. Thank you for watching! This is the seventh Halo game that I have reviewed overall. 
It is the sixth one that I have reviewed in a row. If you have been watching through all of this retrospective on the series, seriously, thank you. This has been a ton of work. When I started, I simply wanted to offer my own different perspective on the series. The perspective of someone who never quite understood why the original trilogy got all the hype that it did get. I thought I would have something unique to offer to this series because I was coming from a different place than everyone else. Honestly, diving into the lore, I think I have more of an appreciation for it than I did when I started. It does not hurt that I enjoy ODST, Reach, and 4 as much as I do. At this point, Halo has been at the forefront of my thoughts for about a year, as I have gradually worked my way through reviews of Halo 2, 3, ODST, Reach, 4, and Wars, all in the span of about 12 months. And I want to take a break from this series to do something else. I know there are two more major Halo games that I have not covered, those being Halo Wars 2 and Halo 5. I have not played either of those and need to play through them on my own time before I can do a good review of them. I will return to this series eventually. In the meantime, what do you guys think of Halo Wars? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Are you indifferent? Leave a comment below and let me know. If you could drop a like and a share this video, that would help me out a lot. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of future projects. I do know what I am going to do next. It's been a while since I've reviewed a piece of hardware. Talk to you later, everybody. Doom Dog out. <laughs>